situation. But that less than enthusiastic response was understandable. Few student personnel administrators saw themselves as educators. More importantly, when I was invited to speak, I did not know such a profession existed or that there were graduate preparation programs. Goddard had 180 students when I went there uh, with 30 administrators, faculty and staff, and we faculty members were advisors and played the, a lot of student services type roles. The project on student development, which together with the Goddard Evaluative Research was the basis for education and identity, involved 13 diverse small colleges, all with enrollments of under a thousand. So I didn't know enough to frame my comments to that NASPA audience in ways that would connect with these experienced professionals. And as I looked out over that audience, I didn't see a single woman. So I could later see why I bombed <laughs> on that particular occasion. In the late 60s, the teach-ins, sit-ins, and other forms of student activism triggered by the Vietnam War with the horrendous North Carolina and Kent State shootings helped us recognize that higher education needed to be about more than cultivating the intellect. That was, at least in my experience, the first serious and very powerful form of civic engagement. Even though it only occurred at a minority of four-year institutions, and at those, it involved only 5 to 15 percent of the students. But it demonstrated the impact a small, dedicated, organized group can have, not only on their institutions, but on the national consciousness and discourse. It strikes me now that right-wing extremists using TV and ubiquitous websites are doing the same thing in today's new communication technology age, influencing policy debates and public opinion in ways far outweighing their numbers. But we need to note a key difference. These extremists, at least from my bias, intentionally use misinformation and disinformation to bolster their positions. The Vietnam War protesters did not do that. The facts were powerful enough to speak for themselves. Well, pardon me for that political aside. I'm sorry if I've offended anyone here. I just feel very strongly about uh, this whole dynamic. Well, back to my historical overview here. <laughs> In the early 1970s, federal policy decided to support higher education by funding students instead of funding institutions, students through grants and loans. Russ Edgerton, who later became a wonderful president of AHE, and Frank Newman, who later had the de headed the development of Campus Compact, were in the U.S. Office of Education then and, and helped with this legislation. The basic idea was that with financial support, students would seek high quality education and be a force for change. An expression of uh, current market mentality in a way. Open admissions replaced selectivity. But institutions anchored in their meritocratic orientation weren't prepared to deal with this diversity, with this wide-ranging variability in academic uh, preparation and social class, race, and ethnicity. Adult learners, mainly women, also began rolling in large numbers. This massification of higher education accelerated the whole community college movement and powerfully drove us toward an increased emphasis on professional and vocational preparation. It also created revolving doors, where large numbers of open admissions students flunked out at the end of their first or second years. These heavy attrition rates raise serious questions about teaching and learning, 
and triggered a spate of reports and long laundry lists of recommendations from major professional organizations. In 1983, 18 high-level persons from government education and the private sector appointed to Reagan's National Commission on Excellence in Education presented a nation at risk. This influential report, in my reading, focused exclusively on content, on information transfer, and, again from my perspective, it basically proposed doing longer and harder the educational practices that already were not working. Then in 1984, involvement in learning, realizing the potential of American higher education came out. Sandy was part of that study group, as were Herman Blake and Howard Bowen, Z. Gabson, Bud Hodgkinson, Barbara Lee, and Ken Mortimer, who chaired that group. So this and other reports during those years focused almost exclusively on policies and practices, not on outcomes. Note also that the seven principles for good practice in undergraduate education that C. Gamson and I put together in 1988 and 89 with help from Sandy and other researchers concerning college impacts on student developments. Those, that was also silent on outcomes. So even as late as 1989, outcomes concerning moral and ethical development <clears throat> uh, and other dimensions of personal development and civic engagement were not part of the conversation of higher education. True, student personnel professionals, with a few notable exceptions, have been talking about and arguing about greater attention uh, to student development. In fact, in 1977, when Joe and I went to Memphis State, Joe was hired to be a counselor in the Center for Student Development there. And some professionals were also taking seriously Jane Lever's ego development and Larry Kohlberg's cognitive and moral development and Bill Perry's scheme of intellectual and ethical development. In 1981, my modern American college argued for taking human development as the organizing purpose for higher education with chapters addressing various areas of curricular content and educational practices. But all this was very much on the margin. Higher education was increasingly about professional and vocational training with the associated skills and information. One counterforce to this trend was the American Association of Colleges, later to become and universities, that became a champion of liberal education as it remains today. Jerry Gaff and Z. Gamson, both good friends and colleagues, made strong contributions to this work. But the language of values or character development and civic engagement was not really part of that discourse. In the September-October 1999 issue of About Campus, Sandy gave us a useful perspective on those times. In Involvement in Learning Revisited Lessons We Have Learned, he wrote, although we argue that institutions need to focus more on student outcomes, we avoided specifying what any of those outcomes should be, instead arguing that this task should be left largely to the individual institution. In retrospect, I think this was a mistake, he writes. If we had been more forthcoming about our own values with respect to some of the most important student outcomes, we certainly would have generated more controversy, but I think the controversy would have been healthy. More specifically, I wish we had spoken more directly about the importance of so-called affective outcomes, such as self-understanding, tolerance, honesty, citizenship, and social responsibility. End of quote. So from my perspective, this was the 30-year background and the policy and practice mentality of the 1980s, 
that John took on. 